Hello, chào mừng các bạn đã quay trở lại với kênh Vật lý Chill Đây sẽ là tập 8 của series phỏng vấn các thí sinh từng tham dự Olympic Vật lý quốc tế hay iPhone Tập phát sóng lần này rất đặc biệt khi chúng ta sẽ được gặp một huyền thoại Người hiện đang làm huấn luyện viên trưởng cho đội tuyển Olympic Vật lý Mỹ Đó chính là anh Kevin Cho Anh không chỉ nổi tiếng trong giới giáo dục Mỹ mà còn được bạn bè quốc tế biết đến Trước tiên Chúng ta hãy cùng nhau điểm qua phần profile của anh Kevin Vào năm cấp 3, anh tuy là một cậu bé hơi gầy gò ống yếu Nhưng vẫn mang về cho mình hai huy chương vàng iPhone vào các năm 2012 và 2013 Khi lên đại học, anh trở nên đô hơn và nhìn rất lãng tử Cho thấy vật lý có thể biến bạn trở thành những hot boy và hot girl Anh tốt nghiệp bằng cử nhân ngành vật lý toán từ đại học MIT vào năm 2017 anh còn nhận bằng thạc sĩ về toán từ Đại học Cambridge vào năm 2018. Anh cũng lãnh thêm bằng thạc sĩ về vật lý lý thuyết từ Đại học Oxford vào năm 2019. Hiện tại, anh đang theo học chương trình tiến sĩ vật lý tại Đại học Stanford. Về phần công việc, anh bắt đầu là huấn luyện viên cho đội tuyển Mỹ từ năm 2017 và được đôn lên là huấn luyện viên trưởng trong 3 năm gần đây. Wow, một bản CV thật là chán lệ. Thế nhưng, điều khiến anh được mọi người biết đến đó là nhờ cái website vật lý của mình Mình có để link website ở phần bình luận Nên mọi người có thể xem qua Website này có đầy đủ các thông tin của anh Kevin Như là CV Các bài nghiên cứu Và đặc biệt nhất đó chính là cẩm năng dạy học Anh có một phần chuyên nói về Olympic vật lý Bao gồm giáo trình ôn thi Và các bài luyện thi Để mình cho các bạn xem cái giáo trình ôn thi của anh Giáo trình này liệt kê rất chi tiết những cuốn sách giáo khoa vật lý từ cơ bản đến nâng cao để hỗ trợ cho kỳ thi Olympic. Nếu bạn cực kỳ đam mê và muốn học xa hơn phạm vi Olympic thì hãy bấm vào phần link này để tham khảo các nguồn sách nâng cao khác. Những phần còn lại sẽ là các nguồn bài tập và đề thi Olympic cũ để bạn có thể luyện tập. Giáo trình này được tham khảo bởi rất nhiều học sinh và huấn luyện viên đến từ khắp mọi nơi trên thế giới bao gồm cả Việt Nam nên nó cực kỳ uy tín luôn Nếu bạn nào muốn mình làm một video để phân tích cái giáo trình này thì hãy comment ở phần bình luận nhé Người đồng hành cùng mình trong buổi phỏng vấn sẽ là anh Luis Mendoza tốt nghiệp ngành khoa học máy tính từ Đại học Cao State Long Beach Và bây giờ chúng ta hãy cùng nhau vào buổi phỏng vấn thôi nào Oh good morning Kevin, hi Good morning Morning Let's just do a quick introduction My name is Dui I'm the representative of the Vietnamese physics community, and our job is to help promote iPhone to Vietnamese students. I hope that like your story will inspire them to learn physics, like, you know, a right way, maybe you can say that. Sure. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And also, I think this is a great program that you guys have put together. It looks very organized. And you even have like the full radio podcasting setup. Like that microphone must have cost quite a lot. I'm Luis Mendoza. I'm just, a, you know, Dewey's friend. Cool. Okay, so uh, yeah, let's just start with the first question, Kevin. Back in the day in high school, like how did you find your interest in physics? Were you like influenced by someone, let's say your teacher or your parent, or just being curious on your own? Yeah, so I think that um, the way I got started was like a lot of people in the US physics team, just from taking ordinary high school physics classes. And so here in the United States, we take, in uh, high school, you take one year of physics, one year of biology and one year of chemistry. And then that's how a lot of people get started is they just enjoy, they have a nice teacher, you know, they think the material is interesting. And for me, basically, I'd always enjoyed doing math competitions. So since I was even in elementary school, I did a lot of math competitions, um, but I also really liked science in general. And so when I started learning basic physics, I thought this was really like, you know, this is the part of science I liked the best. Like I could feel that logic made sense, things mm -hmm. clicked, you know, I could derive things. I was always asking my physics teacher about how do you derive this equation? You know, where does this come from? You know, is there an experiment I can show, you know, that shows this? And um, sometimes they didn't have the answers, but when they did, it was really nice. And when they didn't, I of course went off the internet. And so in those days, there were a lot of um, online resources coming out. Um, mm -hmm. Now there are many, many more. And so I had a lot of fun just going all over the internet, you know, going on these, all these forums, looking at these online lectures and um, learning a lot of stuff myself. And basically the more I learned, the more I enjoyed it. And the more I enjoyed it, the more I decided to learn, so. I really, really do enjoy. How about before? 
like you know high school what about your middle school what was that like what were were there was there any programs that you were in during that time uh, actually no and so you know I, I mostly did math competitions so I you know I went to these summer camps for math and um you know, I met a lot of people at competitions and that was a lot of fun yeah when, when did that, that start like developing Oh, uh, really seriously around sixth grade. So we have this okay. thing called math counts, which is like the main middle school math competition in America. And oh. a lot of schools have their own like little teams. And I got to meet people, you know, and just hang out after school, eat donuts and, you know, do math problems. Mm. That was, that was basically it. That sounds fun. What about like your, the first time you found out about the IFO or when, when, when did you take interest on it? Uh, so in my school, when we did high school physics, they also had us do the ethical MA competition, which is the first round for um, you know the U.S. physics team selection. And uh, I also thought it was really a fun test because it was like it really required you to think conceptually about what was going on in mechanics. So um, I just barely managed to pass the test. And then they had you know the U.S. physics Olympiad. And I think one thing I didn't really appreciate is that. Um, when you study these kinds of basic school subjects and you, if you only study in school, it's hard to get the full picture of like what's out there. So, you know, of course I, I you know, would study what the teacher said and I'd look at the school textbook and those school textbooks aren't very good. And I thought, okay, well I can get, you know, an A in the test and then I guess I know physics, right? Like what else, it's not very clear what to do next. So I think what really helped me was I went and took the US Physics Olympiad when I was in 10th grade and I got like about 10%, I just completely failed. I had not only Aww. like most of the questions I had no idea what they were even asking. The ones I didn't know what they were asking, I couldn't figure out. And I was like, what is going on here? Like, I thought I knew physics, right? I have, I have an A in the class, what's going on? And so that really like introduced me to the idea that there's actually a whole class of physics problems out there that are really tricky, you know, like that make you think in a different way. Um, I'm sure that in other countries where the competition scene is like uh, people start doing physics competitions earlier, they probably already know this. But for me, it wasn't until 10th grade, I realized, wow, there's this whole thing called physics competitions. Like I only knew about math competitions. Aww. And so um, I thought, well, I like physics. You know, I know there's like something deep here that I need to understand. And so I'm just gonna spend the next year studying it. And that's how I, I got to the IFO. You know, I was always worried um, in the beginning about, you know, there are some very serious high schools very high ranked high schools in America, where there's a physics team with like, you know, 25 wow. people all preparing physics competitions. And there's like a physics, Ooh. there's like an in-house physics coach that's been doing it for decades. And they have all these materials. And I thought, you know, if, if they have that, then how can I doing it by myself have any chance? And actually, it turns out year after year, um, most of the people that are, um, that make it to the highest levels in the, in the United States Physics Olympiad are actually doing it basically them by themselves. And so um, it feels like you might be at a disadvantage, but really it's all about just learning the physics and the way you do that is by just engaging with it. And uh, yeah, there's, yes. there's no like magic shortcut that, you know, mm -hmm. gets rid of that. Did you like learn calculus at that time or? Oh, I learned calculus in 10th grade. So mm -hmm. I was actually still learning it while I was doing, you know, the intro physics stuff. So uh, it was, yeah. And during your junior year, your 11th grade, like what do you start learning after the introductory level? Yeah, so... Um, for the U.S. Physics Olympiad, there's a standard book called uh, Physics by Halley, Resnick, and Crane. So uh, I think most people that make it to the top levels have read this book. It's a very well-known book. It's used in honors level courses in college. And it was also uh, co-written by one of the uh, head coaches of the team. So wow. it's got like a lot of tricky questions in there. So I just heard about this book online and I, you know, I, I had basically no idea like what the whole, you know, what was the best way to prep. I just heard this book is good. And uh -huh. they were right. It was a good book. So I, I ordered this book and then I got it in summer that year. And I just spent the next six months of my life just reading through it. Wow. And, I mean, that's it. And it, that it's not that, you know, I didn't require like an extensively complicated prep program. I just needed the book because it was well written. It has everything in there. Um, at that point, I did some practice tests, you know, took the Olympiad, passed, and that was it. Yeah. Oh, wow. In, in six months, you finished a lot of topics. That's, that's amazing <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> wow. Sure, but it's also like, um, you know, I think that the amount of topics you need to study is not actually, you know, it's not a huge amount, I think, because mm -hmm. as long as you're consistent and you set like reasonable goals, mm -hmm. when people go to college and they learn, you know, introductory college physics to be physics majors, uh, the kind of stuff they cover in the first two semesters is basically the same as what's in these, um, you know, books like How to Resonate a Crane. So if a college student covered in a year, then, you know, it's definitely possible to cover it in, you know, half a year because you know, the college students are also taking like four other courses at the same time. Damn! I think the reason that I was motivated to read this whole book is just because it was interesting. And I feel like um, 
you know, if, if you like physics, this is going to happen. You're going to read the book, you know, like chapter 12 and, you know, mm -hmm. momentum or something. And um, it'll just be interesting. There's going to be all these neat examples, all these questions you can ponder about how it applies to everyday life, you know. And um, that was really, what really kept me um, reading. It was like reading a good novel. Just there's like a new twist every chapter. Uh, how about like for the process of the iPhone? Like you, you mentioned that you weren't like discouraged after the first time you took like the test that you got a 10% on it. But like, like did any of the process discourage you? And how did you keep motivated for that? Um, well, I guess so. I, I wouldn't call it discouraging because I, I, I had no expectation of doing well in that test. Okay. Right? This was, so, um, so I think it was more a wake-up call like, that the failure was motivating just because I knew that there was like a concrete target that I could look at. Uh, another thing that really helped me with the motivation is that um, after doing the uh, more advanced books for a while, so the Halley, mm -hmm. Resnick, Crane, um, I would start mixing in like actual competition problems. So I would mix in old F equals MA exams and then I'd mix in quarterfinal problems. That was like the second le level of the Olympiad. And then I'd mix in semifinal questions, which is the final level. Mm -hmm. And um, gradually I would do this so that I would, you know, do the F equals MA and like, I think I was doing those in January. Then I was doing the mechanics quarterfinals in February and then the mechanics semifinals in March or so. And I could tell that I was getting better, you know, like the scores were going up, you know, whenever I didn't know something, I'd like, you know, make sure to remember it. And the next time around I get it. And just feeling this incremental progress, I think was really important. And, you know, I, I have to say a couple of things, which is sometimes, of course, when you do badly, it's just because you weren't prepared for the particular subject. Like, you know, and when I did my first physics Olympiad, I, of course, got zero on the thermodynamics question. I got zero on the relativity question, but that wasn't anything, you know, anything bad about me. It was just that I was, you know, I didn't know those topics and there's something I could learn later. The other thing is that um, sometimes when I would do practice problems, January, March, February, um, I sometimes would do really poorly. Like sometimes I would just have no idea what to do and write down nothing at all. That did happen for some of the questions. And that's just something that you need to take in stride because that's just part of, that's part of the nature of preparing for competitions that sometimes questions are going to be completely different, come out of nowhere and um, just be like much more challenging than you would otherwise expect. If, the, if you didn't have that kind of thing happen every once in a while, then competition would be very boring, right? It'd be like some mm -hmm. kind of school test. Thank you. And beside IFO, like during that time, uh, do you do any like, you know, personal physics research or project? Or are you just like focusing on practicing IFO? Oh, I actually, so yeah, this uh, physics research thing, that is quite a popular thing to do. Um, I personally was against starting research. And so I guess my opinion might be a bit different from most, but I feel like it's not a good idea to really start doing physics research um, too early. So mm -hmm. when I went to college, even I didn't start until I was um, in <coughs> late in my junior year in college. That's when I first started doing research. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, first off in, in, um, so, you know, of course, doing physics research at, in high school, part of it is you want to know what it's like to be a physicist. But the truth is you can't really know by doing high school research, because at that point you have so little background knowledge compared to what, you know, a graduate student has, that they have to give you these very artificial problems. Like they say, okay, well, you do this one little part of this part of this part of the data analysis, and they tell you exactly what to do. Or, um, you know, or maybe you'll be doing some experimental work, but you won't really be aware of the overall like context of why the work is important. And so to me, I thought that wasn't really rewarding. You know, I think in the beginning, it's what's important is to get the basics down by reading things like textbooks. And then, um, then you can really appreciate why you're doing the research. After, you know, your low score in the first epical to MA, you work hard and finally you make it to the, your first iPhone in 2012. Mm -hmm. So can you tell, share us your feeling at that time when you joined like, your first ever iPhone at that time after, you know, a long process of learning? It was uh, okay. It was a great experience because, um, you know, first off, you get to go with your the country's team. And that's a lot of fun because, you know, you've been hanging out with these people nonstop for, you know, weeks because of all this training. You know, you've been going through the same training together. Um, you get to hang out with the coaches. Uh, you get to visit all these crazy countries. So we <laughs> do this thing where we show up a few days early, but we show up in like a different country just to do some site, um, some tourism. And the point of that is just so that we can get acclimated and get in the right time zone and everything. And so it was also like a mini European vacation. So mm -hmm. it was just a lot of fun. And then uh, when we went to the IFO itself, it was just incredible fun to meet all these people from different countries. Um, yeah. I think maybe a little extra fun for us because we were the American team. And for some reason, everyone wanted to, us to give them like a dollar bill or some kind of American uh, <laughs> memorabilia. Yeah. So before we showed up, we had, to, we had to load up on all these like flag pins and like, you know, dollar bills, of course, and all these little American themed trinkets because people just love these things. I don't know why. And um, 
And then we would get, of course, like, you know, theme trinkets from other countries too. Like I still have a bit of Vietnamese money, for example. Oh, and, really? Uh, great experience. Um, just meeting from so many different countries, right? I remember that um, after the exam and 2012 was probably the hardest exam in like a really long time. That was the one in Estonia, crazy exam. Um, we had no idea what, what to do with one of the questions. It was this one about superconducting tubes. None of us had figured it out. So we went to ask the Chinese team because um, you know they reliably do extremely well. But the problem was that none of us could talk with them because you know this is the language barrier. Really? And so what they did was they um, they were trying to sort of like um, do this um, charades thing, explaining what the solution is. So um, it was I think it was moments like that, like trying to communicate with different people that way. That was like a lot of fun because it's like that shows you that physics is something that's really universal. It's not about what language you speak. You know, it's mm -hmm. the same ideas for anyone in the world. Uh, do you remember when how it felt when you for, what, first won your gold medal? Um, so, I mean, I, I was never really that into it for the, the gold medal. So I wasn't really uh, holding my breath that much. Like mm -hmm. I, I had not even expected to make it to the top 20. So, oh. and then when I was in the top 20, I did not expect to make the top five. And when I was in the top five, I honestly didn't really expect a gold medal either. I was just like, oh, I'll take gold Aww. or silver. So um, to me, I wasn't that wrapped up about it. And I think that's actually a good thing because I, I do know some people get kind of get really nervous about it. And then that yes. starts, like that can only do bad stuff to you, right? Because yeah, it if does. you're yes. motivated enough to work, that's what matters, right? And if, if it helps, the idea of a gold medal helps you get motivated to work, that's very useful. But if it starts getting you nervous during the exam, then it's just completely deadly. Um, so for me, I was just completely relaxed. And the way we did it was um, at the, uh, during the Eiffel, you're separated from the people, from the coaches while they, you know, do all the stuff. And then after all the grading is over, over, you can finally talk with them again. So that's when they're supposed to tell you, you know, oh, we think that, you know, this, this is how the medals are going to come out. So we just had dinner. And at the end of the dinner, our coach was like, okay, this, you know, you got gold, gold, silver, gold, silver. And that was it. And for me, you know, I was, well, for, first off, I was just having, I was in relief that I didn't get like a, like an honorable mention or something. So, um, because that year was very, very difficult. And then for the gold, I was just extremely surprised. And it was just a pleasant oh, surprise. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, in 2013, you also participated in your second iPhone and you also <laughs> won another goal. So how, did you do anything differently from 2012? Like, did you learn more advanced physics, like beyond the introductory level? Oh, yeah. I think I, I learned a lot of stuff. And I think so. So again, you know, in the U.S. physics team, I think it's very independent. So one thing they do is when you get the physics camp, uh, they immediately give you a stack of textbooks. And so basically oh, publishers give us textbooks for free because, you know, it's like free advertising. So um, when I went home after the junior year and I finished the iPhone, I had this stack of textbooks that I had this high that I wow. could just go to. And so I learned awesome. uh, more advanced mechanics using Morin's mechanics book, Klebner and Kalenkow. I learned more advanced electromagnetism from uh, Prashel and Morin's book. Um, and then I just started learning more advanced stuff like at the college level. So stuff like, you know, waves, more advanced relativity, um, statistical physics. And so... At that time, that was 2013, that was when the, uh, the massive online open courses thing was starting to take off. So um, you were getting a lot of these, you know, top universities posting courses for free, you know, with all the materials and the homework problems and the solutions and the exams mm -hmm. and the lectures, everything. And to me, that was, it was just so novel and really exciting. So um, that year I did a lot of those courses. I did um, MIT open courseware. I did yes. like a bunch from there. I did an astrophysics course from Caltech. I did a cosmology course. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a quantum computation course. I think it was just it was just so exciting because um oh wow you know, when you're at school and you don't know about these things it's just like there seems to be a cap in the knowledge right like you read the school textbooks and they're not very good and you ask your physics teacher and if they don't know then they don't know that's it you know there's nothing you can do about it mm -hmm. but then you know that was like I was discovering all this stuff on the internet and um, I think these days people are really in a great position and I know that there's kids in high school now that know just so much like sometimes they know like almost all of a college major's um, uh, knowledge already just because there's so much stuff accessible now and so many, it's so much easier to find. So I think that's a, that's really a good thing for society. Uh, what, what inspired you to become a, the, the coach for the U S team? Oh, um, I mean, the way we, rec we recruit coaches is just that, um, we always need new coaches. And, uh, what happens is when you, if you've done the U S physics team stuff, and especially if you've been to IFO, then when you go to college, you'll probably get an email later being mm -hmm. like, Hey, do you want to coach for us? And so they gave oh. me that email and I was like, Oh yeah, sure. I'll do it. Um, I mean, it's basically like if you enjoy this kind of physics, right? And you enjoy, especially if you, especially if you enjoy teaching, then it's a no brainer. Like it's definitely something you want to do. Uh, can you share us like your experience while working for the U S physics team? Like, for example, uh, how was your style 
of teaching differently from each year? Oh, sure. Yeah. So, um, so we have a very intensive and very short camp, mostly because of, you know, that's, the, that's what we can afford. So we have 10 days. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is cram a lot of material into a very short amount of time. And so when I went to camp in high school, I was absolutely terrified by just how much stuff I was learning. Like it was like you had um, some teachers that would just try to get as many equations on the board as they could. So they would just continue writing equations as fast as they could for like an hour without ever stopping. Um, and you had other people that were just, um, you know, they just sit there and say, okay, well, here's a brain teaser, you know, how does this work? And then you just puzzle over it. Um, so there was a variety of teaching styles and we don't have a standardized teaching style. Interesting. What I did oh. was I started adding these conceptual questions. So it's like beginning of lecture two, hey, you know, from lecture one, you know, here's the very basic question. And then I would get completely terrible results. And these are great students, like very, very bright students. You know, so it, was, it wasn't that they couldn't figure it out, it just they didn't remember from what happened yesterday. And so then I realized, okay, I really do need to change my style if I want them to retain stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so then I, I changed to this thing called active learning, which is um, instead of just lecturing all day, like, you know, I'm just going blah, blah, blah right now, but you would just kind of lecture in only like two to three minute chunks. And then you get as fast as you can to like a little practice problem they can work with themselves or in little groups. And then you'd have them do that for two minutes. And then you do a little more lecturing and then another practice problem. And so I changed it from, you know, an hour and a half long lecture to like 15 separate little problems they could do. And um, that seemed to work really well. And they also got to like, you know, talk with each other a lot, get more comfortable with each other. So, um, but of course not everyone does it this way. There, of course there are disadvantages, like you can't cover as much material. Uh, but, um, so we don't have like a single teaching style, but I think the, the variety is also pretty fun. Uh, what do you enjoy the most about being the, being the US coach? Yeah, I think it's really, um, I think it's really interacting with the students because they're just mm. so enthusiastic about physics. So one thing I would wow. do is um, sometimes, for example, I would show up at the lunch table and everyone's you know eating lunch. They've been just, they've been taking class for four hours already, or they've already had like a three hour long exam. They should be tired. Mm -hmm. And I, I just call it like, Hey, who wants to hear a physics problem? And of course, <laughs> everyone wants to hear and everyone's gathering around, you know, people, some people are like bringing out their pencils and stuff. Uh -huh. And then they're like always, you know, up for solving a new puzzle. And I think that's what really is fun about this camp. People are really like willing to think about things. Um, and also, you know, when you're doing a lot of uh, lectures, you will get these incredible questions, like, you know, deep questions that you never have thought of before, even when you've been to college. So I did learn a lot of physics um, from talking to students and talking to other coaches that I don't think I would have learned in just textbooks or college classes. Like there's some real subtleties we had to work out. And it was a lot of fun. How did you encourage the team before like participating in the IFOs? Like what, what how do you motivate them? Oh, um, one thing I would do is I would always say, well, look, we're the American team. And a lot of people, for some reason, are going to look up to us, even though, you know, we're not like, you know, in charge of America or something. But the yeah. fact that we are the American team may, means like a lot of people all over the world will want to talk to you. And they'll, you know, they'll think that they want to know how, what you're doing, how you prepared. And so um, I said, OK, when you go there, you know, you have this kind of responsibility you know, that, you know, maybe you're not like, you know, the emblem of America. But to a lot of people, you're going to be like, you know, the first group of Americans they meet. And so um, that, I think, helps get people pumped up for like going is like, um, uh, and as for actual, the actual training, it is a little bit difficult because most of the training for IFO is done on an individual basis. So our camp with 20 people ends and the uh, five chosen people go back to their homes and they have to train on their own for a month or two mm -hmm. because, you know, we don't have the budget for a month long camp. And so basically there you just have to keep checking in with them and making sure that they're like doing all right. Because it is kind of a lonely road. Like sometimes when they start doing these IFOs, sometimes they can be really tricky. And then if you don't have anyone to talk to, it can be very difficult. So we try, just try to keep the communication going. Easy, miss. I've got you. you you've got me. Who's got you? Can you share us like uh, your feelings about a Vietnamese IFO team performing throughout a year as a coach? Sure. So when I was in high school, I was always, I was, I was very surprised because I, I looked at the medal rankings, right? And I thought Vietnam is actually doing very good compared to like its population, right? Of course, you expect mm -hmm. China because it has over a billion people to do very well, right? But Vietnam was also doing extremely well. Yeah, and of course, you know, you. when I was in 2012, I sat next to two Vietnamese uh, gold medalists. So I was always very impressed. Um, and I think that's continued to be true um, that, you know, Vietnam is still doing like a lot better than countries with similar like economic situations and similar populations. So I guess you guys must have like a solid training program together. Mm -hmm, yes. It's also the thing, which is that, um, if you have a solid training program, then you can do very, very well. Like I think Taiwan is like such a tiny country, but they also do fantastically. Singapore mm. does amazingly too, right? And so, yes. Good job. 
So how about like your major and, you know, while you were doing your undergrad at MIT and why did you choose that major? Uh, so I actually wasn't sure about what to major in the beginning. So I first I wanted to major in computer science and then later I decided I wanted to major in math. And then I ended up getting a double major in physics and math. And so in the beginning, I really had no idea what I wanted to do. And so my first two summers, I didn't do physics research. I worked at Facebook and then I worked at Dropbox and then I worked at a finance company. And so um, I really was just had no idea. Um, and I think it was good. One thing that was really good about the Olympiad was that um, it brought me time to do that. So mm -hmm. I was coming in already with the knowledge of like half physics major. So I could have these extra years to kind of fool around and not really know what I wanted to do because, you know, I knew that I could still graduate in time if I had to later. Oh. You know, of course, the reason I tried computer science is because, you know, you go to these colleges, almost everyone tries computer science because they think you know, there's um, yes. this kind of thing about like, well, if you're not completely sure what you want to do, this is the default, right? Like this is how you end up with like a, you know, a decent life and like, you know, you retire with like a nice yard and stuff. Like this is what you got to do. And if you, you know, don't do this, then, you know, your life is, you know, what could happen to you, right? But so of course I got swept up in that and I started doing it and I, I did all these internships. And the thing was that while I was doing them, I just noticed that I never got the same spark of like, this is incredible. You know, this is an amazing insight. You know, I seen the world totally different. I never got that spark like I did with physics, like every single day. So what I'd start doing is that, you know, I would of course do my job, but then in between doing the jobs, I would have spent a lot of time reading physics textbooks because it was just, I just thought that was more interesting. And eventually I was like, okay, I can't keep this up anymore. I'm just going to do physics period because this is clearly what I like better. What were your favorite and least favorite things at MIT? Um, uh, yeah, so let's see. Um, well, I guess... I don't know. There's, there's just that this, that's like four years of my life. There were just so many. <laughs> things that um, I think that MIT was just, um, I think the most amazing thing about it was that it gave you so much freedom. And um, mm -hmm. for example, um, the dorm I went to called East Campus, when I showed up, you know, the first day I showed up, um, they were building this giant roller coaster. And so. And so that was um, something that's really amazing about MIT. I don't think you can find a lot of other colleges. You know, yeah, I don't think you can. And there's no one out there being like, oh my God, are these people going to like fall and die? Like there's, you know, you just do it. Um, so um, I think a lot of stuff like that in the first couple of years, um, they were not very academically productive, but um, just things like that were a lot of fun. Um, maybe least favorite is that um, just due to the way it worked. Well, least favorite is the winter weather. Like there's, there's oh, like- I Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Free feet of snow sometimes, oh, but no. um, I think part of it is that these tech schools, so Stanford, um, Carnegie Mellon, uh, MIT, and schools like this um, tend to be extremely dominated by computer science majors. So there is this kind of thing where if you're not really sure what you want to do with your life, it's hard to say that you're doing anything besides computer science, just because people will think, okay, well then are you setting yourself up for failure? Because like, aren't the only good jobs in America left in computer science? Like there's this kind of presumption like on board mm -hmm. and it gets reinforced in these career fairs where you go there and like 90% of the career fair is computer science. And then like in the corner huh. somewhere is, you know, like there's one person for like nuclear science and like there's one person for physics and so on. Um, so I think it can be hard to find your way there if you're not, um, you know, you can end up defaulting to something that you don't really like that much. Yes. And also like after MIT, we know that like you, Drawn like two different master program in UK, like one in Cambridge and one in Oxford. I don't know why like each master program only for one year. Is that oh, they design uh, that way or you yeah, learn so fast? Yeah. Um, so design that way. In UK, there's these um, there's taught master's degrees and research master's degrees. Uh, the research ones are one or two, but the taught ones are all one, I think. So you know, mm. just one year, very intensive courses. Hey, tell about. Uh, the difference in style between Oxford and Cambridge and maybe which one you preferred? Mm, it, it's kind of hard to, so, I mean, for me, like the big culture shock was, of course, both are much more formal places than the United States. Like you need, mm -hmm. like even ordinary things like going to dinner, you'll need to put on a fancy gown and everything. And you wear your cap and gown all the time. Um, so, and, but um, I think between <clears throat> Oxford and Cambridge, I think the main difference is that Cambridge is more like a, it's more pastoral and Oxford is more like a real town. So in Cambridge, for example, there's like a, there's like cow fields, like right outside the colleges. So on your way, you know, you can pet a cow on your way to your class or something. But um, in Oxford, like, you know, there's, there's actual, there's actual like tall buildings and everything. And um, there's like, a, of course, there's more stuff you can reach in a small radius, but it's also like, a, there's more hustle and bustle. I think that, 
say that Cambridge feels competitive, they might be thinking it's because the master's degree is, you know, if you do physics there for your master's degree, you do something called the mathematical tripos, which is mm. just, it is a year long exam. So basically like there is no homework, there are no midterms, there's no finals, there's nothing at all. And then in the end of the year, you have two weeks of nonstop exams that it cover everything covering the whole year and they're, you know, super hard. So um, I think a lot of people, you know, that is the defining part of the Cambridge experience. You know, the, mm. there is this crazy exam that you spend all year studying yes. for. And um, so if you, if you focus a lot on the exam, I think that it does feel like quite a competitive place because of course, you know, it's all about like where you rank and stuff like that. But um, if you, you, there's also like a lot of time to relax before the real exam crunch season starts. What are you currently working on for your PhD program in Stanford? Uh, so, so right now I'm, I'm doing research in particle physics and in particular, I'm thinking about um, new ways to detect dark matter. So Ooh. what I did over the past year was I found a new way to detect axion dark matter. So this is a kind of dark matter that behaves more like a wave than a particle. And so the way you detect it is you need to find, you need to construct systems in your lab that resonate with these waves. Um, and we found a new way of using a superconductor to do this much more efficiently. What is your career path after your PhD? Uh, so if you want to become a theoretical physicist, you finish your PhD and then you do a postdoc. And then you do another postdoc and then another postdoc. And basically um, every, every year you apply for all the postdocs you can. Uh, so you might put out 50 applications and get one. And then while you're doing this, every year you apply to be a professor. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the postdoc positions are quite hard to get and professor positions are extremely hard to get. They're so hard that um, there's a website called the rumor mill that lists every oh. single professorship position in uh, the entire country for my field. And it's like, the website is like, you scroll down for like, you know, like once or twice and that's it. So- what? Okay. There's like, I think some years, like, it's like, there's like, you know, like barely double digit, you know, it's in the, it's in the teens. So um, you apply for every opportunity there is every year until finally you get some interviews. And I hear that it's a very arduous process. Like, you know, people deal with like, you know, hundred rejections one year, you just got to dust yourself off and get a hundred rejections the next year. And eventually, you know, hopefully you get a job and then you get tenure wow. and then you become a professor. Um, oh I don't know how it's going to go. Like everyone tells me that it's going to be very, very difficult looking forward, you know, especially oh. the pandemic. A lot of places have um, funding freezes, uh, but you know we'll see. I mean, personally, I'm still I'm still enjoying the day to day, so I just mm -hmm. am not going to think too hard about um, mm -hmm. how the you know job market's going to be in five years. And for students, you know, who like uh, you know interested in follow the same career like you, like theoretical physics. So, do you have any advice for them if they want to follow the same career path? Um. Well, I think the most important thing is. Um, well, first I would say that if you feel like you didn't follow the right path, it doesn't really, you shouldn't worry too much about it. Um, because sometimes, you know, people go to college and they're 19 years old and they say, oh, you know, you know like I, I've seen this person that did the Olympiad and they're already like, you know, a year or two ahead of me. And how am I ever going to catch up to them? You know what? And, mm -hmm. you know, am I already doomed? That's not really how it works because um, it's not really about catching up to other people, right? So what it is, is you need to, in order to do research in physics, you need to understand physics. In order to in physics, you need to spend a long time thinking about it, you know, puzzling it over for yourself and solving problems. And so the most important thing is to think, okay, is to keep in mind that that's what you need to do. And um, as long as you're dedicated and, you know, you keep, you keep interested, then you will get, you get, you will get there, you get the foundations laid eventually, and then you can start doing research. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the idea of comparing is like, oh, you know, there's someone I'm sitting next to that's doing better than me. Then, you know, that doesn't make sense. Cause what if you were sitting next to someone different? Like it's just totally, you know, these comparisons are completely random. Um, and, but as for what's, what's good, of course, it's um, starting early is better just because it gives you more flexibility. Like for me, starting uh, two years early in high school, seriously studying it, gave me two years to, to goof off when I went to college. Um, and really just getting engaged with the process of physics in general. So um, the hardest thing I think when you're in college, if, you're, if you know you wanna do physics professionally, then the, the hardest thing after that is knowing what field of physics you want to do. Mm -hmm. and so. I think the most common thing that people do is they'll say, oh, well, by default, they'll say, I want to do theoretical physics. And they're not really sure what they mean by that. Right. So a lot of people think, oh, well, I want to do whatever, you know, Michio Kaku does, you know, like, you know, like a warp yes. drive, time travel, you know, is that theoretical yeah. physics? String theory. Almost, you know, effectively, no <laughs> one. That's amazing. You know, almost, I mean, it, it makes great documentaries, right? Or, but mm. almost no one works on like warp drive. And it's a, it's a fine subject, right? It is a fine subject. There's nothing wrong with working on warp drive, but that's not what really physics is about. It's like a odd thing that you do is like on the weekend, if you can look, check out like the work that's been done on warp drive, which is not very much because there's not too much you can say about it. And you know, what our day-to-day -day job looks like is completely different. So what, what you need to do is really figure out what kind of physics am I really interested in? 
is it going to be some kind of experimental physics? Is it going to be some kind of theoretical physics? And um, if you don't know what the fields are of theory, then that, that's something that's very important to figure out. So I recommend going to as many different talks as possible, mm -hmm. seminars, uh, li listen to professors present the research and just figure out what sounds cool. Um, for example, one thing that most people don't know is that um, the most common field of theoretic physics is not like black holes and warp drive. It's actually condensed matter physics, which is this physics of, it's the stuff that um, grew out of solid state physics. So the physics of like um, materials and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. And so you should look into that and figure out, you know, am I interested in this? You know, have, give everything like a fair shot. You know, are you interested in optics, atomic and molecular physics? You know, are you interested in quantum computers, uh, condensed matter? There's like a whole lot of stuff out there. So it's important to keep an open mind when you uh, decide what to work on. Uh, well, besides physics, what do you do like for hobbies or, you know, to pass time or maybe distress from, you know, act actually doing physics? Oh, sure. So uh, back when I was in Oxford, I did rowing. So, um, you know, uh -huh. I'd get up at five in the morning and go out and it was like freaking, you know, freezing. And then we'd, uh, we'd, row, in this, we'd row for a couple hours. That was fun. Um, then um, in the past, last year, I, I got into rock climbing a bit because everyone in this area in the Bay Area does that. Um, and that was oh, also so fun. cool. Denver, Denver has a dedicated rock climbing wall. So you just sort of, you know, you bike from your office there. Um, and then since then, you know, it's, well, okay, so then the pandemic hit and I've been just stuck inside for a year. So mm -hmm. uh, kind of outdoor hobby just kind of stopped existing, unfortunately. Um, one thing that I do have fun doing is I like teaching physics. So um, I spend a lot of time writing. Um, so I write articles about um, like, like various little things in physics. I post on things like Physics Stack Exchange, which is an excellent website for learning physics, by the way. Um, if anyone is wondering um, where they can find really credible information about like just conceptual issues when they're learning physics, I think that site, Physics Stack Exchange, is like probably the best one. Um, there's a lot of other sites like Quora or Yahoo Answers where the information is just really, really poor. And like, you know, the answers, like there'll be like three answers and all of them will say completely different things. And then mm -hmm. later it'll turn out that all three are wrong. That happens all the time in Quora. I don't recommend it. Um, but yeah, so I, I write, I write um, like posts on there. And I also oh, teach wow. a bunch of students on the side, just like in introductory physics, just because, you know, the act of teaching, I think is a lot of fun. It keeps wow. you stuck in a rut when you do research. I love teaching. Do you have any any word of encouragement for the student for a learning journey? Because, you know, the physics is a long process. You have to learn a lot of like stuff. So do you have any word of encouragement to encourage them? Well, you have to remember that um, physics is kind of showing you, physics is this um, amazing set of ideas that was unearthed by some of the, you know, some extremely clever people over hundreds of years of careful work and experimentation. So whenever you look in a physics textbook and you think this doesn't make sense, or this is very hard to understand, or you, know, you, you, want to, you need to turn the idea around you know, in your head for a while, just remember that each paragraph in your introductory physics textbook took you know, extremely clever people, maybe their whole mm -hmm. lives to figure out, because yes. that, that's just how hard it was to figure these things out. So um, I think the most amazing thing when you look at something, learn something new about physics, is thinking how could people ever figure something like that out? And um, you know, how is it that, you know, humanity with, you know, us, you know, starting as, you know, living in our caves, just like fire and sticks and stuff, have figured out all this detailed information about the natural world, these fundamental laws. Um, I think that's really the most um, uh, inspiring thing about it. So, uh, yeah. Yes. On the behalf of the Vietnamese physics community, like I and Louis, like, thank you so much for sharing your very valuable information, valuable story that, like, not so many people, you know, have a chance to hear this, like as a perspective of a former contestant and also a coach of the U.S. team. If you have any questions about learning physics or conceptual questions, mm -hmm. uh, feel free to email me. So my email address is listed on my website, which I think I mentioned earlier. And, yeah. um, you know, I'm always happy to hear questions. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Kevin. Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you so much. Quay trở lại với vật lý chiêu, mình xin được điểm qua lộ trình học vật lý của huấn luyện viên Kevin. Anh bắt đầu học giải tích vào năm lớp 10 và có lấy một lớp vật lý cơ bản tại trường. Cũng vào năm nay, anh có tham gia kỳ thi học sinh giỏi lý quốc gia nhưng đạt kết quả dưới trung bình. Để cải thiện bản thân, anh tìm đọc cuốn cơ sở vật lý của Halliday Resnick vào học kỳ 1 của năm lớp 11. Sau đó, anh dành thời gian giải các đề thi Olympic cũ và được chọn tham gia iPhone 2012, đạt được huy chân vàng. Sang năm lớp 12, anh mở rộng phạm vi học tập vượt xa Olympic vật lý bằng cách đọc những cuốn sách như Nhập môn cơ học cổ điển của Morin, 
một cuốn nhập môn cơ học khác của Klebner và Colin Cao, điện và tự học của Purcell, dao động và sóng của French, thuyết tương đối rộng của Hoddles. Với lượng kiến thức khủng khiếp này, anh dễ dàng chinh phục iPhone 2013 và mang về huy chương vàng lần thứ hai. Đáng nhớ rằng, những kiến thức này tương đương với kiến thức lý của sinh viên năm nhất và năm hai ở đại học. Ok, về phần cảm nghĩ của mình, đúng là nói chuyện với huấn luyện viên trưởng có khác. Anh là người không chú trọng quá nhiều về thành tích. Ví dụ như dù thất bại trong kỳ thi học sinh giỏi lý quốc gia, anh vẫn vui vẻ đón nhận nó. Bởi vì, mục đích chính của anh là được học hỏi các kiến thức vật lý nâng cao mà trường cấp 3 không thể nào cung cấp. Còn ở các kỳ thi iPhone, anh luôn luôn cảm thấy thoải mái. Theo anh, việc thi đấu vì các huân chương cũng là một động lực lớn, nhưng nó vẫn có thể phản tác dụng khi mang đến cho bạn những cảm giác căng thẳng và thất vọng nặng nề nếu chúng ta không thành công. Ngoài ra, anh cũng có chút phản đối về việc các học sinh cấp 3 thường chạy đua thành tích bằng cách làm các nghiên cứu từ quá sớm. Lý do là vì lượng kiến thức của các bạn khá là hạn chế so với các anh chị đã học thạc sĩ và tiến sĩ. Cho nên, dù có được làm một phần nhỏ của các bài nghiên cứu, các bạn khó có thể thấy được mục đích và tầm quan trọng của nó. Nói về mảng dạy học, mình thấy anh là một người rất có tầm và có tâm. Có tâm khi anh lập hẳn ra một website, liệt kê ra những nguồn học vật lý chất lượng dành cho những bạn đang tự học. Khi rảnh, anh sẽ lên trang web Physics Stack Exchange để giải đáp các thắc mắc về vật lý, viết các bài báo khoa học và chia sẻ kinh nghiệm học tập. Cuối cùng, huấn luyện viên Kevin có lời động viên dành cho các bạn đang tự học vật lý. Anh khuyến khích mọi người không nên cảm thấy chán nản khi đọc sách, bởi vì những kiến thức trong đó là một quá trình lịch sử dài để các nhà vật lý học có thể phát hiện ra. Ngay cả những người thông minh nhất cũng gặp khó khăn trong việc thấu hiểu vật lý Cho nên các bạn không cần phải buồn nhé Hãy học theo cách mà bạn cảm thấy thoải mái nhất Và không nên so sánh bản thân với người khác Sau tất cả, chúng ta học vì đam mê vật lý hay là vì thành tích That's my passion. Yeah, và đó cũng là những gì mình có trong video này Ở video tiếp theo và cũng có thể là tập cuối của series phỏng vấn Olympic vật lý quốc tế Chúng ta sẽ gặp một người có chức vụ cao hơn cả huấn luyện viên Kevin. Đó chính là giám đốc học vấn, vị trưởng đoàn của đội tuyển Mỹ, giáo sư Cha Cha Dong. Do đó mọi người hãy nhớ đón xem nha. Ok, xin chào tạm biệt và hẹn gặp lại. Bye.